Well, my computer just uh, said seven o'clock, so uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning to all, and uh, again, we're grateful for you to be here this morning. Uh, just uh, our monthly update here that happens on the third Wednesday, and, and this morning we have Dr. Uh, Mark Welch and Dr. John Robinson, and also we have a special guest, uh, Stacy Gorman, who's the director of communications for the Cotton Board with us as a guest, and uh, we will hear from her a little later. Uh, just want to make mention of our sponsors, the, the, uh, the Cotton Board, the Texas Sorghum Board, and the Texas Corn Producers Board, who uh, have uh, graciously uh, helped us out and, and uh, have sponsored this event since its inception. So uh, again, thank you for that. And uh, with that, I, I, if you have any questions, pe uh, be sure to uh, look at the chat, uh, pull up the chat and uh, feel free to, to uh, send us a question and we'll try to get it answered. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dr. Mark Welch and he's gonna talk uh, grain marketing and then we'll hear from Robinson and, and Gorman as we progress through. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Welch. All right, Bobby, thank you very much. Uh, good to be with y'all this morning. Um, as we get uh, kicked off here, get the uh, slides up and going, I would just pin it, put in a, a quick plug. Uh, you're going to get a little bit of uh, market fundamentals here uh, this morning, but uh, we still are ongoing with our master marketer program. And uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m., we will have our uh, market fundamental uh, discussion. I'll be uh, getting in a lot more depth in the grain markets uh, than what we're going to have in you know, 10 minutes here this morning. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Robinson will be uh, exploring the cotton fundamentals, and we'll also have uh, Dr. David Anderson with livestock fundamentals. So uh, shoot me an email or go to our Master Marketer webpage. Just put in your search engine, Master Marketer, T-A-M-U, and you'll have all the information. You can still register and join for that meeting, uh, which again is tomorrow at 10 a.m. if you'd like to jump in and, and get a little more in depth of what we're talking about uh, here this morning and, of course, other issues around the market fundamentals. As we're looking at 2021, and that's, I'm, I'm <clears throat> excuse me, shifting my focus to that market, I'm assuming that for most producers, that whose grain crops are out of the field and gone, uh, your, your crop is gone. Uh, you may have taken some option or, or position in the futures market to reown that crop, but generally speaking, uh, the cash grain is probably uh, on its way somewhere else. And so uh, taking our focus then to what I expect the main drivers for 2021 to be, and here's two of them. Uh, one will be the, uh, whether we keep uh, China involved in the markets to the degree that they have been specifically in 2020. And the other would be the impact of the uh, La Nina weather phenomenon, which is continuing to build. At this point, it looks like the conditions uh, in terms of the measurement of temperature degree deviation from normal will match the intensity of the La Nina event in 2011. Now, the good news is it's not expected to last as long as that 2011 and 2012 event, but it, uh, the current forecasts do call for something with that same degree of intensity. So uh, certainly that will have some impact if that, if that forecast holds true. Uh, the likelihood that it will have a significant impact on crop production in the Southern High Plains, uh, particularly across the Southern US and, and Texas. Uh, this just highlights in our sorghum market, uh, when China was in the market, then we had the trade war with China, China got out of the market and our exports to China went to virtually zero uh, for about six months. And now the degree that they have emerged, again, the strong number one buyer of US sorghum. And if that holds for 2021, that's a very positive indicator. And uh, the US is the world's top exporter of sorghum. There's not a lot of other places to go. And, and so with the China's economy recovering, uh, grain demand uh, should be picking up in that part of the world. Now we're talking probably more as a, of a food grain uh, when we talk about grain sorghum in China, uh, but, but the fundamentals would appear to support their uh, continued activity and presence in the grain export market going into 2021. This is what I'm, I'm looking at the corn market. And uh, do I expect prices in 2021 to be higher or lower than they were in 2020? Now we're, we're, we're closing out this year on a nice little rally. Uh, but if you look at where uh, the October futures price has been, we're about 380 or 390. And here in 2021, we're harvesting about 90, or planting, excuse me, 91 million acres of corn. 
and the current average yield estimate is 178.4. This black line would indicate whether stocks are going to go up or going to go down next year relative to where we are right now. And obviously, if we reduce ending stocks, that's an indication of perhaps something of higher prices. If we add to those ending stocks, that would be pressure for lower prices. Given a use estimate, and this is about uh, three or 400 million bushels higher than the 2020 marketing year, but if we can increase use by about to about 14.9, 15 billion bushels, that would be the 15 billion bushel use line. My current estimate, and I've got you know, some uh, that I'm pointing to acres next year of 92.4 million acres, and I'm plugging in a La Nina adjusted yield nationally of 175 bushels. If that were to play out in that kind of use estimate of 15 billion bushels, ending stocks for the 21 marketing year are gonna get a little bit tighter. Not a lot, but we're gonna fall a little bit below that line. And that would bring some kind of upward pressure on prices from where they are uh, closing out 2020. Again, not, not a huge factor, but some small degree of increase. My concern on this, I'm using 92.4 million acres, in the planning intention survey last March, U.S. farmers said they were going to plant 97 million acres of corn. With the rally that we've got going on the corn market right now, you push that planted acre out to 97 million and a yield of 175, we have a significant addition to ending stocks. And again, 175 is, is below trend line yield. We could come up with a yield in the upper 160s and still not add to ending stocks if we plant that 97 million acres. So these are factors to watch, I think that are gonna really gonna drive our market expectation and, and mark, market uh, price patterns as, as we move through the winter. I think we're gonna give a lot of attention focused on, on that planted acres number, which will relate primarily to the soybean price, but also around the impact of the La Nina and the degree to which uh, the market expects that it could impact uh, the yield expectations for, uh, for 2021. So I think that's just some kind of shape or expectations around that. So I'll plug in all those numbers, 92.4 million acres, a yield of 175. There's my use of 14.974 billion bushels. That brings me out a price of 386. Well, that's about where we've been uh, here in October, even with this price rally that we've got going right now. So uh, again, I think we're looking for some uh, you know, tightening of stocks to a small degree and some upward pressure on prices. But, but nothing of, of a huge significance. And, and so if you look at the, the way that we, we follow the relationship between this, this days of use on hand at the marketing year, which is our stocks to use ratio, and the season average farm price for corn, we, we've got a pretty strong relationship there. Here we were in 2019, we're wrapping up 2020, probably a little higher than fundamentally we ought to be, but a little, little better strength in the market. And then here's where I've got us pegged for 2021. 2021. Again, moving a little bit to the left on days of use, tightening up the supply, and a little bit higher on the price, uh, bringing us up to about 370, 380 on a, on a season average farm price. So not blowing the top out of the market under those uh, assumptions and expectations, but something perhaps a little better uh, than we saw in 2020, particularly if you sold that grain in, in, uh, in July and August, uh, like, like many folks down in South Texas would have done. Uh, I think we're looking at a better price structure uh, moving into 21 than we had for, uh, for 2020. So just kind of to summarize, I think we still will see acres up. The question is how many, uh, but I do expect somewhat of a below trend line yield because of the La Nina weather phenomenon. Energy feed use, probably a little lower. The livestock industry doesn't appear to be expanding at this time, but uh, that's, we got a long year ahead of us. Uh, fuel use increasing from last year, but not back to the previous highs. I don't see us setting records for ethanol production uh, in, the, in the near term. Uh, exports, it depends on our uh, crops and our global competitors, which are increasing. And so I'm looking for a slightly smaller stocks to use ratio, slightly moderately higher prices. But again, still tracking the, uh, the long-term impact of the coronavirus and the pandemic on the global economy. How deep and how long is this recession, not only here, but around the world. And then, of course, uh, maintaining positive trade relationships, given the importance of exports. But, but obviously, the, the dominant feature, uh, I think, in next year's mar uh, market story is, is going to be the weather. And so, as in terms of a marketing plan, I do think these prices on the, this is the December contract uh, for corn. Uh, we touched $4 yesterday. 
I think it's uh, worth looking at your expectations for your, uh, your cost of production, the basis in your area, what are your contracting opportunities? Does $4 corn on the board work for you? Uh, there are some opportunities out there, uh, I think, with, to take advantage of this rally, at least to provide some kind of floor, uh, increase that safety net, look at some put options. If those are too expensive, maybe uh, uh, selling some calls or a cash forward contract and buying a call. Uh, there are some tools out there uh, where we can still secure a price floor, but leave that top side open for what yet could be some better pricing opportunities. But this has been a great rally in the market that I hate to see get away. You know, the last uh, five or six years, uh, $4 corn has not been a bad place to be. Uh, and so I think it's something we sure need to take a good look at. I'm gonna close with this. I don't think I've shared this slide. If I have, it's worth looking at again. Uh, this is information from the University of Minnesota. It's called their FinBin database. And this shows net farm income by farm size in 2019. And you can see that the smaller farms from 100 to 250 acres, that uh, the average income on those operations was about $23,000. We get up to these 2,000 to 5,000 acre farms. They, they uh, had an average net farm income of 2019 of $189,000. Now the blue line represents the top 20% of financial performers in the data set. The red line represents the bottom 20%. So as you get bigger, Yes, you can make more money, but you can also lose a lot more money. The top 20% performers of these larger farms uh, had net farm income of $466,000, whereas the bottom 20% lost $146,000 in 2019. <clears throat> and, and so I, I think that's interesting in and of itself, but what I'd like to understand a little better is what are the blue line people doing that's different from the green line and the red line? Can we identify characteristics of those operations that would separate financial performance. And so to do that, I'm gonna look at the corn farms within that data set. This is all operations. This is grain, uh, livestock, forage, dairy, everything all thrown into, uh, into the mix here in this uh, net farm income uh, summary. Now we'll look at cotton, excuse me, cotton. We'll look at corn. Um, first of all, look at the corn yields. The all farm average corn yield in the data set was 178 bushels per acre. The high 20% yielded 191. The low 20%, their average yield was 162. The difference between the high 20 and the average was 7%. Price-wise, all farm average 421 a bushel. Now that's government payments, uh, trade payments, the uh, everything. Uh, insurance indemnity, everything thrown into the into the income uh, basket there. The high 20%, their average price was 436 a bushel, 4% better. The low 20% was 410. And look at cost. The all farm average to produce a bushel of corn was $3.94 a bushel. And that includes management and labor. The low 20% performers, it cost them $4.81 a bushel. The high 20%, $3.30 a 16% advantage from these high uh, efficiency producers, high, high uh, revenue performing producers relative to the all farm average, a 16% advantage. In terms of net return, top 20%, they were making $200 an acre. The average was $53, it was profitable by $53 an acre, but the low 20% lost $100 an acre uh, on their corn in 2019. And so I think that highlights three key management issues that we need to pay a lot of attention to. Are there adjustments that you can make to the operation of your farm or ranch that you can incre increase your production, do a better job of marketing and get better control over your cost? What if you could make a 5% difference in any of these categories? Get that production up 5%, increase your marketing tools by 5%, and reduce your cost, total cost, all across the whole operation. Can you cut those costs 5%? I think those are the kind of things that sustainably will keep us in these higher performing categories relative to the industry average. And I think those are the things that are keeping us in business as farmers and ranchers moving forward. So where do prices go from here? Well, Lord Alfred Marshall in 1890 said they're going to the cost of production. And if that's true over the long term, then we need to get our costs down if, if prices are going to the cost of production. And we also need then to be able to lock in a profitable price when we see it. And so first of all, do you know what that profitable price is? Build those budgets, get those cost expectations and, pro and projections in place, 
And, and does $4 corn work in your part of the world for your operation? Those are the kind of questions we need to be asking ourselves every day. And that 5% rule that I was talking about, 5% uh, increase in yield, 5% increase in marketing returns, and a 5% reduction in cost. If you can do that on uh, irrigated corn, you can cut your cost $115 an acre, or your net return, excuse me, would increase $115 an acre. You can drop that break-even price from 390, you can drop it to 353 a bushel by being 5% better when it comes to production, when it comes to price, and when it comes to cost. And so I think those are the real challenges uh, moving forward for 2021. I don't know what that price is gonna be. Obviously there's so many factors uh, that are gonna drive that, but to put us in the best place, regardless of what that price is, I think this is the kind of management mentality we need to start building into our operations. That's what I brought to share this morning. Uh, appreciate the time and, and Bobby, uh, your efforts to put this program together. I always enjoy uh, being a part of this and with questions or comments or any issues around uh, uh, marketing and marketing plans and marketing grain, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a holler. Thank you much. Thank you, Dr. Welch. Uh, really good information. And uh, like I said, we're grateful that uh, you and uh, Dr. Robinson have agreed to, to do this. It's uh, really good information. Uh, with that, I guess we'll head into the cotton side and uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Robinson. Okay. Let me see. Can y'all see that? Can y'all see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes, good. sir. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to pick up right where Mark left off uh, when he was saying that the two big influences in the 21 corn crop were, were La Nina weather and China influences. That's going to be exactly the same thing when we think about cotton. But before we can think about next year, we got to try to make sense of what's been going on uh, for the 20 crop and things have been kind of exploding, uh, kind of exciting. So, so let's focus on that a little bit. We still have lots of questions about the outlook for the 20 crop, even though you know y'all are all harvested and harvest is beginning across the belt. Um, in other places, we still have questions about the size of the crop uh, these are the October numbers in the right-hand column. That's a 17 million bale crop. And most of us analysts were thinking that USDA was going to trim that estimate due to all the, the storms, rainy weather, tropical events that have hit the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic affected the Georgia crop, you know, from here to Georgia. Um, we were expecting uh, some issues, certainly with quality and perhaps with bull rot and yield loss. And we haven't seen that yet. It hasn't showed up really in the crop weekly ratings. It hasn't showed up in USDA's production estimate. We're getting kind of late in the year. So that's, that's still a lingering question. Uh, and the other big question is what might we see in terms of improvements in the export world? Because there's things going on. We've had the Chinese government continually buying cotton putting it in their reserve. There's been rumors of, or at least the possibility that uh, Chinese mills might be recovering, that they might be coming into the market, hadn't really happened yet, but, but uh, that there might be strong Chinese demand uh, prompted by some policy things involving uh, sanctions on Chinese cotton exports from their major cotton producing region out in the Northwest. And if that was to happen, it would kind of reroute things and force them to import more. That's the, that's the theory anyway. It's out there, it's given some lift to the market. I think it's given some speculators reasons to jump back in and buy the market up. But so anyway, two big questions still on the production side and on the export side, and we're waiting for those things uh, to unfold. Meanwhile, by the numbers, we're left with a, still with a very bearish situation. That's 7.2 million bales of ending stocks at uh, pretty much the same as the previous marketing year. And that's a very heavy, burdensome uh, level of ending stocks. Just by the numbers, we ought to have prices not where they are around 71, 70, 71 cents. That's where they've rallied to in the last week or so. You know, we ought to have prices in the 50s based on this outcome. Obviously the market is not trading 
the possibility of having this much leftover cotton, they're still thinking that either we're going to have a big expansion of demand, see a bigger emphasis of that number is going to get adjusted, or they're thinking that this number is still going to get really seriously trimmed, and, and that remains to be seen. Uh, here's one of the influences. Mark didn't really talk about speculative buying, but it was underlying a bit of why there's a rally in the corn market, and it's certainly the reason why there's a rally in the cotton market. I show you this slide a lot, um, and what I want you to focus on is this, this green area are the speculators that are trend followers that I think are in the cotton market gambling that the crop is going to be a lot smaller, and as they've increased their position here lately, uh, they've been making some big bets. They're, the open interest that they have, that is to say the cotton futures that they're buying and holding has been increasing. And that's, that's the reason that prices have been popping up. I'm gonna show you this, this little area right here in the next slide. So this is, this is a more recent picture and you can see more clearly that the, the trend following hedge fund type folks have really been ramping up their position and they've been pulling prices up and here's prices popping over 70 cents because of what they've been doing. Now, that's, that's good, I guess. I mean, they're, they're, giving you, they're giving farmers a higher pricing opportunity. But what I wanna point out to you, let me back up to, back up to here again. What I wanna point out to you is these guys in green have a history of being in the market and then they back down, in the market, back down. They even go short and then they go long and then they go short. They're, they're, they're a fickle bunch or they're a variable bunch. They, they can change their positions for all kinds of reasons that are rather unpredictable. So the fact that they're giving us prices over 70 cents is a selling opportunity for some people. And I would, I would urge people who have unsold uh, 20, bales to to look at look at it that way but it it could change uh it could change for reasons that we can't see right now so just uh, take take that into consideration here's a picture of uh, some of their more direct influence this goes back to about january and here's the nearby ice cotton futures of course so when the pandemic hit we had a lot of uncertainty we had a shrinking of demand we had trimming of the of the estimates of, uh, of uh, consumption of cotton around the world and the market fell 20 cents, bottoming out at early April. And that was, that was kind of like a fire sale for, for certain folks that wanted to still be in the market buying. The first one being the Chinese government started buying a bunch of bales to replenish their reserves. So that's not commercial buying. That's not real demand. It's a policy thing, but it, it, it is buying. And that's what contributed to the market to begin to recover through the 50s, through the 60s. Then as the summer came in, then we had this influence of both the hedge funds and the index funds, the passive buy and hold types. They were both in the market buying, but the hedge funds were doing it more. And the hedge funds are the ones that are still doing it. And I, I'm submitting that's the reason that prices have popped up over 70 cents. It's because of them. And I think that they think that there's been more damage to the crop because of the rainy weather and the hurricanes and tropical events. And that may be true, it just, it remains to be seen. And whether it turns out to be true, whether these guys just take their profits or whether these guys are disappointed at the next USDA report doesn't cut production, you know, 500,000 bales. Um, sooner or later, to the extent that this is a weather market influence, these guys are gonna probably get out of this particular activity and then that influence isn't going to be there and and then some of what we've seen in this rally may it could turn so i just i want to leave you with that leave you with that thought um so anyhow in the meanwhile prices have pushed farther than i thought they were going to and i'm happy about that i'm happy to be wrong um but as i say if it's to the extent that it's a weather market premium that's that's pushing this speculation i think that has the possibility of turning around and it could turn it could turn fast so uh, people need to look at at this uh, i think as the selling opportunity uh, that it is again now we're still talking about old crops so let's uh, get around to talking about the subject that mark was and that's what about next year uh, right now, if you just look at the relationship of corn prices, feed grain prices to cotton, 
it would suggest that uh, we might plant around 13 million acres. Of course, corn prices have been rallying, but cotton prices have been rallying too. So histories would suggest that right at the moment, um, we could plant a healthy amount of cotton based on, based on what we've uh, got there. Um, when we have a La Nina winter, that means it's generally drier in Texas. And what that typically does is increase cotton planted acres over and above what relative prices would suggest. We tend, we tend to have folks, you know, if, if, if they don't really know what to do and it's dry as heck, they'll dust in some wheat. And then next spring, typically they plant more cotton than they do grain sorghum or, or keep their wheat or whatever. So uh, we may have cotton plantings higher. Of course, we may have higher abandonment too. Um, the way I would pencil it out is uh, assuming that we have a higher abandonment number and a so-so yield, um, I think, and assuming that we have some recovery in demand with improvements in the pandemic situation, I think we have a good possibility of trimming ending stocks. And to the extent that, you know, if we had prices ranging in the 60 cent range for a, a lot of the time this year with this crop, then I could see prices shifting up five, six, seven cents. So we'd be trading from 65 to 75 in the futures uh, for a lot of the time next year. I, I could see that. I could see that happening. Um, so um, now let me say that there's still uncertainty about we could plant, let's, let's say it's really, really, really dry and we end up planting an extra amount of cotton acres. Let's say we plant like 14, that, would, that wouldn't be unprecedented. We saw that in 2011, uh, the planted acreage in Texas went up a million acres because A, it was dry, B, the insurance price was really, really good in 2011. It's not going to be that good next year, but let's just say that the insurance price is established in the low 70s. You know, ice futures could be trading at 72, 73. We could have an insurance price at 73 and it's dry. I, we could plant 13 and a half, 14 million acres. And when you put that much seed in the ground, you know, all it has to do is rain a lot on Father's Day and we'll have a lot of cotton popping out of the ground and then then anything can happen. We'll be in a in a weather market situation and we could we could push the low side of this of this range. You know, I'm thinking prices on average will be higher, that the range will be higher, but there's still downside price risk. Um, that sums up what I wanted to share with you. My contact information is here uh, and Bobby, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Dr. We uh, Dr. Robinson. Uh, again, we uh, appreciate you being on early this morning. Uh, we have now uh, Stacy Gorman, who's the Director of Communications for the Cotton Board, and we're really happy that she's able to be with us this morning and, and give us an update of what's going on in the, in the Cotton Board world. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Stacy. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you all for having me. Um, today, I'm just going to go over briefly what's going on with the Cotton Board. Um, I'll start with a brief overview of what the Cotton Board is, uh, what we do, how we're funded, um, and then I'll move into uh, some of the market implications that we're seeing um, from the pandemic, and I'll end with how we're reaching out to cotton producers these days. So just to start, the Cotton Research and Promotion Program uh, was formed back in 1966 when a group of cotton producers decided to band together to really promote their fiber. So at that time, the large chemical companies were pouring tens of millions of dollars into research and promotion of uh, fibers like polyester um, and other man-made miracle fibers. So think leisure suit era. Um, and during that time, cotton's market share really began to nosedive. So these leaders in the cotton industry were convinced that if they formed a public-private partnership and pulled their resources together, that they could really compete um, with these man-made fibers. So from that, the Cotton Research and Promotion Program was formed. Our mission at the Cotton Board is to serve U.S. cotton producers and importers of cotton by effectively and efficiently governing uh, this program. So to um, 
and kind of break down what the cotton board does. We're the ones who we collect the assessment fees and then we administer and oversee the cotton research and promotion program. So we do that through um, a board of directors that's made up of both cotton producers and importers. And then uh, the role that I'm in at the cotton board falls under that third bullet point, communicating. So our role at the cotton board is not to, to communicate with consumers, but to communicate back to the cotton producers and importers who pay into the program, what's being done on their behalf. Um, that leads us into Cotton Incorporated. So all of the money that we collect at the Cotton Board, um, we then turn around and invest it into our sole source contracting company called Cotton Incorporated. They're the ones who are actually conducting the research and promotion. Um, they, we like to say they do research all the way from dirt to shirt. So they do ag research, uh, fiber processing, textile research, um, and then all the way through to the consumer um, doing consumer promotion. So they're really the company that's charged with creating demand for and profitability of cotton. And then the USDA, we actually pay the USDA to govern our program. Um, so sometimes in the industry, there's a little bit of confusion. Um, there is no lobbying through the Cotton Research and Promotion Program, because we are governed by the USDA, we are strictly prohibited from lobbying. Um, and all of the information that we put out has to be um, approved by USDA, um, just to make sure that um, everything that we're doing is um, approved. And then um, I'm gonna move into how the Cotton Board Assessments um, really fund the program. So at the very heart of the function of the Cotton Board um, is the charge of fiscal responsibility. And as the collection arm of the program, we have maintained a compliance rate of well over 99% uh, for the past 20 years. So that's really a, a industry standard. Um, as far as collections, like I said, both cotton producers and importers pay into the program. So the producer pays a fee of $1 plus 5 tenths uh, percent of the value of the bale for every bale of cotton they grow. Um, this is uh, paid by the first handler. Um, so a lot of times we'll be getting that payment in through the gins or the merchants or co-ops. Um, the importers also pay an assessment and an importer is classified as someone who imports cotton or cotton containing products back into the US. Um, and so these folks pay a very similar assessment. Um, and this year our collections um, are almost 50-50. So 53% of the funding for the Cotton Research and Promotion Program this year is coming from producers and 47% is coming from the import segment. Um, so funding has decreased um, slightly with decreased imports and um, some production events. So the Cotton Board is looking at funding Cotton Incorporated in 2021 at a level of $80 million. And this is down $8 million from um, 2020. Um, <clears throat> we feel like we've done a, a really good job at the Cotton Board of um, managing our resources for the past several years. And so we are well positioned um, to keep this $80 million level of funding um, and remain flexible in that um, as the years progress. But we think we can maintain that $80 million level even in times like these with decreased um, assessment fees. So uh, the program priorities for 2021 through Cotton Incorporated, even you, you know, with the decreased budget, um, include promoting cotton sustainability, product innovation, on-farm profitability, cottonseed value, and uh, lamp contamination prevention efforts. So the consumer marketing division of Cotton Incorporated is actually seeing the largest um, percentage of budget decrease uh, in 2021. 
many of Cotton Incorporated's research programs, uh, specifically ag research, are much less flexible in terms of stopping and starting funding compared to something like consumer marketing, where you can you know, pull some advertising, uh, maybe move some things to digital that are a little bit more cost effective. Uh, and so the research projects are gonna be um, remaining pretty flat as far as funding um, with the majority of the cuts coming from consumer marketing. So uh, briefly wanted to touch on some market impacts from COVID. Um, I am certainly not an economist and you have heard from some great economists so far. Uh, so I'll just kind of defer to um, some overall thoughts. Um, in just over a decade, you have to think the cotton market has been hit with some seismic changes um, that have had really long lasting effects. So the stock market collapse in 2008, followed by the Great Recession, led to really sharp declines in cotton demand and cotton prices. Um, the ensuing recovery contributed to a sharp increase in cotton prices. So you'll think back uh, to $2 cotton. Um, which we thought was great for growers, but ultimately crushed cotton demand because um, our importers and mills, they couldn't afford to buy cotton. And so uh, they switched to other fibers and it's taken us almost a decade to really um, build back some of that market share. So this uh, quote I have up here is from Barry Warsham, the president and CEO of Cotton Incorporated. Uh, but he says, over the last two years, cotton's market share stabilized and in most apparel categories. But now the overall market is experiencing its worst decline since the Great Depression um, caused by the, you know, the fallout of the pandemic. And so given that it appears we're not yet near the end of the pandemic, planning for 2021 has definitely had its challenges. Um, the main theme that has emerged is the need to remain flexible. Um, and that's especially important as threats and opportunities and budget related factors are more and more difficult to predict at this time. So I wanted to touch quickly on a few of Cotton Incorporated's um, kind of their COVID rapid response. Um, the main focus uh, in the face of this severe market disruption caused by the pandemic um, is really rebuilding cotton's supply chain. Cotton Incorporated this year um, is actually celebrating their 50th anniversary. <clears throat> and 2020, although it, has plan uh, although it has proved not to be a year where we feel like we can celebrate much, um, I really think it's important that Cotton Incorporated's 50 year foundation um, of research and promotion, uh, I think it's more important than ever. So Cotton Incorporated is leading the way um, in rebuilding and retooling the downstream supply chain of cotton products. Uh, revitali revitalization of the cotton supply chain is absolutely critical in order to um, regain consumer demand. So across the board, Cotton Incorporated has really quickly adjusted its plans to help the cotton growers and the importers it serves. Um, so one, one thing they've done um, to better understand the effects of the pandemic on consumer habits and attitudes is the um, corporate strategy and pro program metrics department has been conducting surveys on the impact of COVID-19 on consumer shopping habits. And so once they gather this information, they've done, um, you'll see here, this is kind of just an infographic <clears throat> uh, breaking down the results. They've done three waves of this survey so far. And what they do with that is their global supply chain marketing team takes that information and shares it with the companies and organizations and brands and retailers um, and um, really the associations in the world cotton supply chain and shares this information with them um, and really establishes themselves as a source of information um, in an effort to help build cotton demand. Cotton Incorporated has uh, a non-wovens department. And um, as you can imagine, in the time of um, a lot of people not having access to PPE, the non-wovens department has been working with our brand and retail community to help find legitimate sourcing solutions um, to this PPE shortage issues. 
Um, they've been researching how cotton can help fill some of those gaps and really um, making connections within the industry to make sure that um, cotton is in the equation. And then there have been swift changes to the consumer marketing plan. Um, <clears throat> actually, when the uh, pandemic happened, Cotton Incorporated was uh, day one into filming a new campaign in California when the shutdown happened. So they had to pack up, um, completely nix that plan and start over. So um, what they did is they reached out to um, people at home and quickly launched a new advertising campaign sharing a simple message. It's stay home, stay safe, and stay comfortable. And you can do that by wearing cotton. Um, these vi videos um, and commercials that they created illustrate how the pandemic has changed the way we live our lives, but thanks to cotton farmers, essential workers, healthcare professionals, um, those who are working on the front lines, we are able to stay home, stay safe, and stay comfortable in cotton. Um, it's a really timely message that promotes cotton as the fabric of our lives, no matter the circumstances. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about producer communication um, during a pandemic because this is kind of um, my sweet spot in the organization as I um, am in charge of our producer outreach. Um, I will say it's been a bit of a tightrope act trying to communicate uh, during this time. Um, we really wanted to balance making sure that we were, you know, very cautious not to um, really promote ourselves during this time. Um, we wanted to be sensitive to, you know, all of the issues going on in the world, but we also knew our growers weren't stopping. Cotton farmers, um, you know, they had to continue pushing on and we didn't want to forfeit uh, these relationships that we've worked so hard to build over the years. And really the Cotton Research and Promotion Program didn't stop. And so there was no need to stop telling the, the stories to growers. So we just um, had to be a little bit more creative, I'll say, in our approach. And so um, in addition to our standard outreach, which always includes digital newsletters, print advertising, radio um, outreach, we um, crafted a few new ways to reach cotton producers. And the first one I want to talk about is um, our cotton and coffee Zoom series. So with the cancellation of so many industry meetings, which, um, you know, are always so important to keep us all connected, we decided to create a virtual meeting series. Um, so the cotton board is asking cotton producers to wake up with us. And in the time it takes to drink their morning cup of coffee, um, or sometimes two cups of coffee, um, they can get an update from leading experts uh, within the cotton industry and Cotton Incorporated. So each session features a leading cotton industry expert speaker, um, includes a less than 30 minute presentation with time allotted at the end for question and answers. Um, topics have ranged so far from um, how we promote U.S. cotton internationally, the 2021 plan and budget. Yesterday, we actually had a session talking about how we advertise to consumers. Um, and our next session, I will plug really quickly, is coming up on November 10th. Um, each session starts at 7.30 a.m. Central. Um, and this one will feature Dr. Cater Hake, who is in charge of Cotton Incorporated's Ag and Environmental Research Department. And uh, Dr. Hake will be discussing Cotton Incorporated's Ag Research Priorities for 2021 and beyond. So if you can join us for that, we'd love to have you. Um, Pre-registration for the sessions is required. Um, so you could just reach out to anyone at the Cotton Board um, and we could get you set up for that. Um, the regional communication managers um, in your areas are Christy Short um, for the Southwest and Shelly Heinrich for the Southern Plains. Um, and I'll be more than happy to share any of their contact information if you need it. And then finally, um, one of the new ways that we've been trying to keep everyone connected is through a weekly video crop update. Um, we have been reaching out to growers across the Cotton Belt since June. 
Um, and so each week we post, uh, usually on Friday, um, a quick five minute video that gives a crop update from each region of the cotton belt. So usually there are four updates um, within the video, just talking about how the growing season has gone so far, um, what challenges they're facing, how they're basically how their crop is, is looking. And it's a really great way um, to keep growers connected. So I would encourage you to check that out if you haven't. It. It's posted every week on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And I will um, quickly plug our social media channels um, just so that you know where you can find us. The Cotton Board um, is very active on social media and this is um, one of the major ways that we reach out to our growers. So make sure that you're following us on Facebook at The Cotton Board. Twitter, our handle is at The Cotton Board. We also uh, have a YouTube channel and are on Instagram. So that's all I have. Um, here is my email address. If you have any questions or um, there's anything I can um, help you with as far as um, the Cotton Research and Promotion Program, just reach out and I will be happy to. So thanks again for having me and uh, thanks for your time this morning. Lucy, again, we, we uh, greatly appreciate you uh, getting up early this morning and, and uh, being with us and giving us an update there, what's going on with the Cotton Board, very informative, and, and, and thanks a lot for, for that and for your sponsorship of this, uh, uh, this uh, update. So with that, uh, just wanted to uh, again say thank you for everybody that uh, was on this morning. I didn't see anything come in on the chat. Uh, but uh, on behalf of the Southeast Region Row Crop Team, uh, uh, co-host Matt Boche, we just again say thank you, and and uh, I guess that's uh, all for, for all for this update. So everyone, have a good day. Thank you much, Bobby. Good to be with y'all. Bye. Thank you.